still alive oh my god uh, i hope that you are doing all very well we have take the start uh, setting up the equipment first we talked about um setting up reflux last class so basically i'm going to bring the hardware down first and then the uh, the glass first glass first is going to come out last we do need a utility clamp to hold the to hold the boiling flask i'm using a ring stand this time because we don't need the hot plate I'm using a ring stand to support heating mantle. It can it cannot stay on the bench top. It has to be elevated. Uh, it has to be elevated. So I'm using iron ring to support the heating mantle. Heating mantle cannot be plugged into the directly to the wall. So we are using a power regulator to For the um, for the power, and I'm going to plug in when not everything else is is ready. <clears throat> Using a three finger clamp to support the condenser. And the good thing about the three, three finger clamp is that we can adjust the arm length and make sure that this stays straight up and same level with the utility clamp. Okay, the hardware's are ready. Now I'm going to use, if I can find the blue glass right here. We are going to set up first with the empty flask, just to complete the setup. Then I will add the chemicals later. So basically, I lower the heating metal later to get the chemicals into the flask and put it back. For a uh, glass joint, we want to make sure that all the glass joints are greased. So I'm using a vacuum grease to, to grease the joint. I don't want to get the grease into the flat while I'm putting the chemicals in, so I'm keeping it separate. When I have the chemicals in, then I will attach it. So I just want to adjust the, the length, make sure that is is on. Water roses, it would be the lower end. Water in, so I attach the lower end to the faucet for water in, and the upper end, it would be used for the, the water flow, so it would go disposal down the drain. Okay. Is there any question for me? So should I worry about your questions at this point, or should I Continue with the assembly. Okay, good. So let's be um, finish up the assembly and bring my chemicals. I turn on the water first, then I turn on the heat, but I have to first get the chemicals in. Um, based on the procedure, I have page 133. I don't know which, what page you have. Uh, I haven't actually opened the ebook, so. The uh, 10 gram of the benzoic acid with 25 milliliters of the methanol. So I have the. Thank you. 
10 grams of benzoic acid. You could use funnel to, to transfer or make a funnel with your main paper and transfer the chemical into the food mask. So that, that was 10 grams of benzoic acid based on the procedure. So we're not changing um, for anything. And 25 milliliters of methanol in a 100 ml flask. Okay, and I need to add the three milliliters of concentrated sulfuric acid. Con concentrated sulfuric acid needs to be added inside the fume hood and slowly. So I'm gonna have to take the the laptop. That's why I'm using laptop today. I'm going to take the laptop to closer to fume hood so you could see um, dispensing like slowly. And because it's sulfuric acid, I need my gloves first. The better practice and the right lab technique is to use the gloves all the time. Um, lab coats and goggles, sometimes when the chemicals are not that dangerous, that I know they are safe to, to handle it, I refuse to use gloves, but I can't do that with sulfuric acid. So I'm going to take you close to the fume hood. And I'm going to add slowly, maybe a few drops at a time, mix it well, and let it cool off before I add the next portion of the sulfuric acid. When you add sulfuric acid, it generates heat, and if you add all of it at the same time, it can boil the solution, it can foam out of the solution. Because you have concentrated acid, the fumes are highly corrosive, and if it touches your skin, it's going to be highly corrosive. At the same time, you're going to lose your reactant. So whenever you have any exothermic uh, interaction, you want to make sure to slow down the reaction to control any spillage or any problem. Sometimes your reaction make up, it's like highly exothermic, it produces 
huge or significant amount of the heat. In that case, you can place your flask inside a uh, ice water bath, inside ice, and um, you can add the acid slowly. That way, the temperature doesn't go too high, especially if you have to uh, control the reaction temperature and you want to keep the temperature low. That's just like your experiment 14 for nitration. And I post a video for keeping the temperature low or how would you maintain low temperature reactions. So back to our workstation. We need to check the, the procedure with you to make sure we are doing it everything correctly. So pouring slowly down the walls, let it cool before, mix it. And reflux. Um, is boiling chips mentioned there, or we understand that from last experiment, we have to do reflux. Yes, boiling chips is there. Okay. Even if it's not there, we have to add the, the boiling chips. They are mentioned? Okay, good. So we add boiling chips. And now we're going to start the I already greased the glass joint. I'm going to use the cap clamp to hold the two glass pieces together. Center and everything fixed. Bring the heating mantle up. Okay. The heating mantle is what was used as the heating source for, for reflux because the shape of the heating mantle, um, when you have like this round shape, is going to contain the heat and the flask is going to be uh, heated up like more evenly. It's not like a hot plate that only bottom of the flask is, is, uh, is being heated up. So you have the, that nice shape of the the heating apparatus that is going to have like perfect fit. And if you remember from the other experiment, experiment 12, we used a different shape of the of the heating mantle. It wasn't just a different shape, it was a different size. The opening was set for 250 um, ml. That was for this flask, so it had to be a different flask. So we used the other one. Um, I am going to ask you a couple of things today that is different from the first experiment. I want you to take a, uh, a screenshot of the setup at different stages of the experiment and include that as part of your uh, report, part of the lab report, not in the same document. For the assignments, I allow multiple submissions just in case if someone forgets, let's say, to write the abstract, they submit and then they can complete and submit again within the like, uh, you know, 24 hours of submission. So you could have multiple uh, submissions and uh, multiple, sub one of the submissions for this experiment is going to be the pictures. So the images that you have here, uh, you're, I'm asking you to take a screenshot and include that. I'm going to ask, if I remember, um, about four screenshots, and you should have at least like two of them uploaded, and I prefer our four of them. Uh, why they do that in an online environment? Uh, the screenshots right now, I'm going to bring the, the computer close to the setup, and I want you to take the screenshot of the, of the setup for the reflux. 
and I'm going to bring this closer so everything is going to be in the frame. So this is the setup for the for the reflux. Please take a screenshot and include that. Uh, save it for now and include that as a first image in the um, a screenshot files or picture files for experiment 13. The benefit to this new procedure is that just want to make sure even though I don't have really students who are not interested in taking organic two uh, two labs because it's a is the highest level of chemistry we offer students who are in this class they are very highly dedicated and they do uh, everything based on their the, the desire to learn so I don't have to force them but it's good practice for online environment. So this means students who are logged in, they join the meeting in Blackboard, they are also paying attention. They are there, they are following. It's not like my 10 less ever lower class um, that the students try to log in, leave, and then uh, come back at the end, almost the end of the experiment and says, I was here, did you call attendance? Well, when we check the, when I check these pictures, I check for originality. So please do not share with someone. If you miss one, you take a break. It's a long lap, so I don't expect you stay by your computer for two, three hours. So if you take a break, you want to get like, a, you know, whatever break you want to take. I'm sure you, when you come back, you don't worry about the picture that was taken. So that's why we get like throughout the experiment, we get like four or five of them. So you, you would, uh, if you submit at least two of them, you're fine based on the attendance and your participation. So do not share because when I check the originality, it's like it comes up and I don't want anybody to think that I'm, uh, you know, uh, judging students based on. This could be for your concern that if you don't submit all four pages, you might get, your grade might be affected, but that's not the point. The point is for you to, to, be present and actually be involved and be uh, participate. Let me use the charger so it doesn't turn off like the other day it did. I turned on the heat now. And I am going to um, set it up around 60, uh, between 50 and 60 because it's methanol. It should boil quickly and I didn't check if machine if the heating mantle is working or not. It's better practice before you connect it and wait. You can just check this to make sure that it's uh, is working, it's heating up. So it is heating up. Just gonna let it uh, heat up and start start boiling. The reflux has started now. Do you have any questions, or should I check your questions first before we go to? over theory of this experiment. Uh, the screen keeps, okay, the images don't have to be perfect. So that's another thing. Um, so your concern was that the pictures, the, the screen is moving. I can't screenshot because the screen keeps bouncing, okay. Uh, freezes when I okay if your if your computer uh, freezes what you can do you could just use your cell phone um, to take a picture it doesn't have to be a perfect high resolution picture as long as you catch the moment uh, that it, your file shows uh, that is uh, <clears throat> is the, the screenshot was taken during the lap time it's fine so I'm going to bring it closer for anyone who missed the a screenshot you can now take a picture using your cell phone or use the screenshot uh, because it's new I'm not sure how your computer is going to behave so I give you a couple um, options and if none works let me know then I have to think harder and come up with different options Okay, so if I if my hands are 
my hands actually don't shake that much then i have been commented about that or complimented i guess so um but if the computer moves and you get like blurry picture it's okay it doesn't have to be perfect picture of the of the setup because you already have the setup in your in your experiment or i can pull the cart this way computer could stay on the cart for you this way you don't get any moving of the so it's not moving you can take a screenshot now I'm not holding the computer Try to bring it closer. Yes, I will try to bring closer to the setup next to the, like a scale, or next to the uh, to the setup for you to to be able to get the screenshot closer. Okay, let's let me look at your questions and then Yuri again. Mm-hmm. Yes, it does. During different parts of the experiment, and I tell you when to take the screenshot. If you miss one picture, don't worry, you're not going to lose points for that as long as you have um, you have others for later. Okay. Now, how long is the reflux? Again, about 45 minutes. We're going to time it for 45 minutes. And while we are waiting, I can answer your questions, go over the theory for the experiment. Today's experiment is esterification. So we are doing esterification um, reaction. We bring a pen so I can write something for you guys. Esterification of benzoic acid. We start with the benzoic acid. We add the alcohol, which was the methanol. Sulfuric acid, which we are using in this reaction, is just a catalyst. And the product, we actually get two products here, is going to be methyl benzoate and water. This reaction is a reversible reaction. So if you increase the concentration of the water, the reaction would go to left. If you increase concentration of methanol, the reaction would go uh, forward. So basically, we used excess amount of methanol. We used uh, the 25 milliliters that was excess amount of the methanol 
if you calculate the mole ratio, you can you can actually find the number of moles for methanol and benzoic acid. Um, so we are using high volume or excess amount of methanol to make sure the reaction is going to uh, forward and formation of methyl benzoate. Whenever you see a double arrow, you, you should remember the Le Chatelet's principle. If you want the reaction to go to forward, you have to use excess amount of the reactant or remove one of the product. If we had a way uh, to remove the water in this reaction, we would make sure we, are, we will get more uh, benzoic, methyl benzoate or the product of this reaction. One of the methods to remove the water is like you have to basically apply heat to 100 degrees Celsius, which is impossible in this reaction. Why is it impossible to apply heat of 100 degrees uh, Celsius in this reaction during the reflux? Any idea? Because it's a closed system. Actually, I'm glad that you said it's a closed system. This mixture is not boiling in a closed system. It's dangerous to have your uh, to have the uh, either stellation or reflux in a closed system. Um, it is open the, to the top of the uh, the condenser. When I take the laptop there, I will show you again. The top of condenser is open and any vapor or excess of vapor can actually exit through the top of the um, top of the condenser. And that's a good thing because then if we see the vapor coming out, that means we are using too much heat or maybe by mistake the water was turned off and the condenser is not, is not cooling. Or instead of connecting to cold water, you connect to hot water and the, your condenser is like heating pad now. Uh, or you are applying too much heat, which then you have to lower the temperature or lower the setting on the power regulator, make sure the temperature stays controlled for gentle boiling. So gentle boiling is a boiling that it produces vapor, it keeps the temperature high at the boiling point of the solvent, but at the same time, it doesn't, you don't lose the vapor. It allows the vapor to condense from the condenser back into the boiling flask. Um, so any other idea? Any other suggestions for this? Why we cannot heat up to 100? Are we able to heat up the system that we have now to 100 degrees Celsius? What would be the temperature in the boiling flask at this point? It's boiling and it's constantly boiling. It would be equal to the boiling point or approximately a boiling point of the solvent. The solvent that we are using now is the methanol and methanol boils at 65 degrees Celsius. So since methanol boils at, pure methanol boils at 65 degrees Celsius, we added benzoic acid to it as impurity. So it could go to like 70 degrees Celsius, but it's not going to be much higher than that. So uh, based on collective properties, you can actually calculate number of moles, but that's not the purpose of the experiment today, and we are not going to do that. So boiling point of the sample, uh, the solvent is 65 degrees Celsius. So, so the boiling is going to happen at that temperature and will maintain that temperature until the reaction is is complete because it uh, you have attached to condenser so it's impossible to provide 100 degrees celsius to remove water uh, for this reaction if you have uh, the other method would be to add like a to add the water absorbent for the water so if you have like beads of silica gel uh, when you buy like leather uh, product uh, that would be leather shoes or leather clothes something that is made with with uh, leather and uh, you don't want like it, they don't they want to absorb the moisture of the leather uh, because it can form like mold or shape changes for um, some obvious reasons I guess they put the little package of silica gel inside the inside the box so yes you're not supposed to eat those and uh, one of the problems with those with eating or digesting is that 
um, it can get too much water, it can swell, uh, it can uh, swell, and it gets like very large. Uh, like if the kids they they swallow that, it can they can actually choke, and it can dry up your system. It can dry up the, the opening, so it's not safe to eat and it's toxic. So if you put but if you, it, but they are one of the best things to, to absorb the water. They are very clean because it doesn't react with our chemicals. You just put them as a small size beads inside your flask. And when you are done with the experiment, you get like swollen, larger size of beads. You take them out, it absorbs the water. So if when you reach like equilibrium, you can push the reaction toward the formation of product by removing water. So as the water is being produced, you can get the uh, get it absorbed by the silica gel beads. So uh, those glass beads that actually absorb the water and they are stable enough that they don't react with our chemical uh, with the given uh, given temperature. So the reaction is called esterification. Your reactant is carboxylic acid and alcohol, and the product is uh, ester ester functional group. You have the carboxyl group attached to two carbon on each. The uh, mechanism for the reaction, it is explained here. Basically, this reaction is a substitution reaction, and the type of substitution reaction is like a nucleophilic substitution reaction. So what is happening, you have pyramid shield electron on, your, uh, on the oxygen of the methanol, and methanol is going to attack the nucleus of this molecule, which is the carbon with the positive charge or partially positive carbon that you have here. And this will make the pi bond to go to break um, initially. And when the carbon, uh, the pi bond breaks over the oxygen, you get the negative charge. Um, that two mechanism has been uh, proposed. So in your lecture, if you get different mechanism, like if you get the protonation of this OH first, both of them have been uh, different books they, they covered in um, differently and somehow none of them have been rejected so far. So you could get the protonation of the oxygen first. When you do protonation of the oxygen, the carbon that is the nucleus of this atom is going to carry like more of a solid positive charge. So it makes it better nucleus for the nucleophile to, uh, to come in. So when you have your, then the, uh, the leaving group has to leave after changing to a better leaving group. Your leaving group is OH, so it has to change to a better um, OH group, OH2, or the um, water, which is a better leaving group. It would leave, and then you get your OR, or alcohol attached to the carbonyl group, uh, to build the... Um, Ester, the plus charge on oxygen is unstable, so the plus charge must be removed. So plus charge in this case is going to be removed with the, uh, with another nucleophile. It could be alcohol or it could be water in this case, um, either one of them. It can remove the H plus. H plus is removed easily because it's going to make your molecule more stable because this is not a molecule yet you have your oxygen that is uh, pro, um, the oxygen that is uh, it carries a plus charge and that is not acceptable for uh, oxygen because of high electronegativity of the of the oxygen so a protonated oxygen with the plus charge the only way you can stabilize and you have seen that in chapter 8 of your organic one also when you get plus charge on the oxygen you either remove the remove the hydrogen with the plus charge or you remove H2O. So in this case, in this step, you remove the H2O. In this step, you are removing the H+. So you can see that your final product is, is S. Uh, points for this reaction, the experiment based on the lab technique. Again, setting up the reflux. Why we are using reflux? Because the reaction takes time requires high heat so 
we are going to um, we have to use reflux to make sure the reaction is happening for a long time at the high temperature and uh, to assemble the reflux again greasing the glass joint is very important you should never put any stopper at the end of the condenser because this condenser nut is open you don't want to block it if you block it the vapor that is produced inside the inside the boiling flask it can build up high pressure it can break the glass it can cause um, other accidents and incidents so it, uh, boiling should never take place in closed container um, that could be distillation or it could be it could be reflux so this is open system actually if you apply too much heat you will see vapor coming out of this you are losing the sample or uh, because your condenser is not efficient either you have too much vapor or the water flow is not efficient okay let's see if there is any question because it's very similar to last experiment um, you may not have question but at the same time I want to make sure to answer okay uh, can you tell me how we do, do we prove this reaction has taken place and talking about that is going to again um, remind me of design of the experiment when you are, are when you have experiment that is designed for you especially like for teaching lab it must give you a proper procedure a proper procedure that is going to help you to follow the experiment step by step so you already expect what should happen so you have to have a chemical reaction in your chemical reaction um, when you are following the procedure like in this case where it tells you 10 grams of benzoic acid 25 milliliters of methanol you already know that you have a chemical reaction and this chemical reaction is going to happen with limiting reactant and excess compound so you need to know which one is limiting, which one is the excess compound. When you are done with this reaction, you your a complete reaction. It should have, or a complete procedure, or good design of the experiment should have a procedure part that is going to allow you to purify your product. Because when you get your product, you are going to get crude product. And what is crude crude product? Is the product that you think or you assume or you're sure that your reaction has taken place but it's not purified it's mixed with the excess amount it's mixed with the catalyst it's mixed with everything that you have in your reaction mixture you're not going to get 25 milliliters of ester 25 milliliters of ester it's a lot of ester and we i should say you know you might know i was going to say we know uh, esters are fruity flavor additives that is actually added to food products as well as like um, some air fresheners sprays or um, other cosmetics um, so esters are not e hard to make them so it just takes like few drops of the acid alcohol and uh, and the uh, the carboxylic acid it depends on the size of the alcohol that you are using size of the acid that you are using you can uh, you can make ester that has a strawberry flavor or it has mint flavor or it has like oil of wintergreen or banana cherry different type of flavors so all different flavors of ester can be made with the simple reaction of esterification or Fischer esterification rather because you are using carboxylic acid and ethanol and alcohol in general and depends on the size of the acid size of the alcohol you get different flavors if you search up for how to make ester you would get you will get um, a, a table with the list of what should be the choice of acid what should be the choice of uh, of the uh, alcohol if you want to get banana flavor or you want to get the strawberry or cherry or pineapple uh, pear any root flavor uh, that 
you get the uh, you get it's the ester is a product of esterification. And when you read the the food label, let's say you have like pack of candy, you buy it like one pound of candy for one dollar, and it's like it tastes like a strawberry or it's strawberry flavored. Uh, believe me, they didn't pick the fresh strawberries for you to to make that uh, candy because if they did pick fresh strawberry, you wouldn't buy the candy for one dollar, um, the pack of candy for for one dollar. So the strawberry flavored, or you have like cherry coke. When you have a cherry coke that's actually coke, okay, which is the sugar and the, the some colors and the water and carbon dioxide uh, plus some caffeine if it's not decaffeinated um, and then plus some esters that they actually make in the lab one milliliter of the ester is enough to flavor about 100 pounds of candy so when they say artificially flavored that's basically adding of um, adding of um, esters to those food products so application of this experiment it's it's uh, very um, significant in the food in industry at home uh, but with the product that you are getting it must be purified so you have a chemical reaction that you're basing your procedure based on uh, you're starting your procedures you have a chemical reaction so when you write the chem procedure your procedure should include the limiting reactant and excess compound because if you don't have excess compound your reaction actually is going to happen especially if it reaches equilibrium your the yield of the reaction is going very low and you don't want low yield of the reaction then you have to have a purification technique what is the purification technique in this experiment um, you could get extraction you could get distillation you could get uh, if you have a solid compound you could get decrystallization and in this case you are using extraction right because you are using butyl uh, methyl ether to extract the product. So after your reaction is done, you would do extraction for purification of the food um, product. And what is the last step? The last step for, for to make sure your reaction is complete, your experiment is complete, you have to have a way of identification. How would you make sure your reaction actually took place? How could we uh prove that our product is ester and is not the benzoic acid mixed with methanol is not water what did you see in this experiment an ir at the, the end IR. and uh, i'm not sure how much of the ir you have been uh, exposed to or you know uh, already ir is the infrared uh, spectroscopy with the infrared spectroscopy, you can identify functional group and each specific functional group. Each functional group has a specific uh, wave number that the peak appears in that location. So for alcohol, the peak is going to be around um, 3300. Uh, for ketone, is going to be, that's for OH1. For ketone, is going to be CO double bond around 1700. For um, aldehyde, you are going to have a peak around 1,700 plus two other peaks, one at 2,700, one at 2,800. A carbon-carbon triple bond would show a sharp peak at 3,300. So based on the IR, you can determine your, the functional group. When we are using, when we are learning IR, that would be like experiment 17, that we will have some, some uh, Introductory IR, uh, we learn those numbers, but when we are using application of the IR in the experiments, we look at our experiment to say, okay, what is the point of difference here? I have carboxylic acid, I have ester. Carboxylic acid, if it's an open chain carboxylic acid, if it's not conjugated, is going to have a peak at 1715. Okay, 1715. Ester. If it's not conjugated, it's going to have a peak at um, peak at 1730 to 1740. So basically, the location of the CO double bond peak is going to shift 
from 1715 to 1730 or 1735, 1740, depends on what are the environments of that CO double bond. Then it's going to um, is going to um, change. Uh, if you have if you use IR, you can also prove that your compound is is pure. You could use the pH. The pH is expected to drop if your sample is pure. Or if there's any impurity left over of the sulfuric acid, still is going to show you low pH. But pH by itself is a qualitative analysis. It's not strong enough to determine the purity of the samples. Um, so we can predict that the pH in this case is going to is going to increase because carboxylic acid is being consumed, that ester is being produced. But to defend your case that you do have pure product or definitely have a product, you need a stronger need. Like melting point last time, melting point is very reliable. IR is reliable if your compound is pure. If the compound is not pure, again, the old saying of chemists, garbage in, garbage out. IR, it takes like three minutes to do experiments with the IR or less. It takes it's very non-invasive. You take a drop of the sample, put it, and uh, the only problem with that is that if your sample is not pure, if it has any impurities of alcohol, it's going to show PCAT to 300. Then you don't know if this is coming from carboxylic acid OH or is the impurity from uh, from the alcohol, or if there is leftover of benzoic acid. Benzoic acid uh, is going to be because you are washing with water, you're washing with the acid. Uh, and the uh, sodium bicarbonate, it should be removed. It should be removed during the experiment. But if there is any leftover, it's going to have also peak at a at, uh, broad peak between 2,500 and 3,500. So you have, the, uh, you have the method that is used for identification today is going to be IR. During the procedure, during the extraction, what is extraction? Did you review extraction from previous experiments from either experiment four or from the lab techniques for extraction? How extraction is applied in this experiment? Why are we using extraction? Or when we do extraction, what is actually happening? We are using ether as the extraction and our product is a methyl benzoate. What is happening in extraction? Do you remember from organic one? Uh, so you're separating by polarity? You're separating by polarity. Separating by polarity is a better, uh, you know, or more definite answer for uh, for chromatography. Uh, you're separating by polarity. For when you are using, uh, you are using extraction, basically you have to set up extraction and you are using separated funnel for the extraction. Uh, in extraction, you have two layers. One is an organic layer, and the other one is uh, is aqueous layer. The organic layer or aqueous layer is determined based on density of the two layers that you have. So you you are going to have two immiscible layers. Um, so you have to choose your solvent properly. The extracting solvent it should dissolve your compound of interest. So in this case, the methyl benzoate should be dissolved in the solvent that you are choosing, which is the ether. Uh, because it's polar, we, put, we pick like an ether as a polar solvent um, that is going to dissolve the methyl benzoate. Your extracting solvent cannot be miscible with water. So alcohol or ethanol can dissolve methyl benzoate, but since alcohol is miscible in water we are going to have everything mixed up in one layer so you cannot separate so it must be immiscible and it might it might have high solubility of your sample in the in that layer in the extracting layer so 
the factor that is used is known as a partition, partition coefficient. And the symbol for that is the KF. Partition coefficient is the difference in solubility of your sample or ratio of the solubility of sample in the organic layer versus the aqueous layer. And uh, is going to your sample is going to be highly soluble in one layer and very low solubility in another layer. And you have to do uh, multiple extraction. The design of the coffee maker is based on basically extraction because you actually you think that you're brewing coffee but you're actually doing extraction so extraction is used in this case we are using the ether as organic layer is going to pull up or dissolve this the methyl benzoate in the organic layer um, we drain the aqueous layer aqueous layer is going to have the methanol it's going to have the sulfuric acid and uh, those are the two solubles, yes. If there is a benzoic acid left over in the reaction, where would it stay? In the organic layer or the aqueous layer? The aqueous layer? Benzoic acid. Benzoic acid, how many carbons do you have for benzoic acid? Seven carbon for benzoic acid, right? If you have seven carbon for benzoic acid, um, Anything more than five carbon is not going to dissolve in water. So benzoic acid is going to dissolve in hot water, but not cold water. Benzoic acid could stay in the in the organic layer also. How would you separate the benzoic acid in this reaction? How would you remove the excess of benzoic acid if there any left over? That is the answer to your question. That's what question. we use the sodium bicarbonate for. Very good, yes. When you use the sodium bicarbonate, you wash the organic layer of sodium bicarbonate. It's going to react with benzoic acid, and the benzoic acid is going to change that to sodium benzoate. So it's an acid-based reaction. Sodium bicarbonate with benzoic acid is going to give you uh, acid-based reaction. The product is going to be salt and water. Uh, so basically you get carbonic acid, H2CO3, and with the H2CO3, you are going to get, you are going to get the, uh, <coughs> it will decompose because it's very unstable. And when it does decompose, it's going to, uh, it's going to change the water and CO2. And that's why when you are using that solvent, to wash your organic layer, you need to make sure to shake it and dry the way you have to vent it. In the fume hood, you have to vent the, uh, the separator funnel to, to release the pressure that is built up. Otherwise, you have this holding or you place on the stand is going to pop up the cap. It can fly actually distance. It has happened in the lab when the students forget to wet it or, or leave it there for a long time or the temperature is high, it builds up pressure and is not funny. So if it can hit your eyes, it can, it can cause any, it's just accident. So you have to vent it a couple times. So you are doing multiple washing in this case. You are going to wash with water. You are going to wash with sodium bicarbonate. You are going to wash with sodium chloride. And uh, when you do that, um, each time, the rule is, I think I told you like five, five, five for the recrystallization. When you have a solid product, you get your sample five uh, minutes in ice, five minutes in a vacuum, uh, run the vacuum, and then five minutes for, uh, for the oven. In the um, extraction, there are like, Three terms that I, I use to make it simple for students to remember, and it must be done every time. So you have to, for consecutive extraction, you have to shake it. And when you are shaking, it depends that if you have a chemical reaction or you're trying to wash, you want to emulsify it. So you don't have to shake it really hard, but you have to do that at least two, three times. You shake it, shake it, vent it, and separate. 
So shake it, vent it, separate. Shake, vent, separate. Those are the three words that they should come right after one another, one, one after the other. And it kind of rhymes, and you have to remember it that way. Because if you add first, first time is adding a sodium bicarbonate. You shake it, you vent it, and you don't separate. Shake and what? Uh, shake, vent, venting means you open the stop book to release the pressure. Then you close the stop book, bring it to the right position. You place inside the iron ring and uh, let it let the layers to separate with the two layers form and take the cap off. Open the stop coat to drain the lower layer. If you don't drain it and you go to the next step, wash with sodium um, chloride, then you are going or wash with water. That is going to just react with the sodium bicarbonate. It's not going to wash the organic layer. Or sometimes you are doing consecutive extraction. If you add the first portion of the solvent and the first, like, 15 milliliters of the ether, and then you would uh, not separate it. Then you add the second 10 milliliter or 15 milliliter. You add it, you separate once. That's just one extract, it counts as one extraction. It doesn't count as two to the extraction. The greater number of extraction, the better the, the, better the separation. Uh, because the Extraction is based on partition code or the difference in solubility in the organic layer versus or extracting layer versus the other layer. So for for this, you are going to have you are going to have the um, the let's say your compound is ninety percent soluble in organic layer, ten percent soluble in water or aqueous layer so your solvent sounds good you can separate 90 percent each time you do extraction so with the first extraction you get 90 percent of the organic layer out you separate you leave it in a container then the second time when you do extraction you get 90 percent of the 10 percent that is left that is like nine percent and if you repeat for the third time you get 90 percent of the one percent that is left so it's going to make it better separation. But if you do just one time extraction, you only get 90%. So you get 10% lost, one time extraction. It doesn't matter what is the, the, you know, the volume of the solvent, you still get 90% if the soluble is like 90%, 10%. When you look at the coffee makers, like the traditional for American coffee, uh, making uh, or brewing American coffee, it doesn't pour the hot water, like one cup of hot water through the, the coffee beans or the, the coffee grind. What it does, it changes the water first to steam, and then it's going to spray the steam one at one time, well, like in multiple times. If you open the coffee, uh, like the, the, the top, the coffee maker, you would actually see that it's actually spraying the water or the steam or hot water. Now, some you can buy coffee maker maybe for ten dollars. I have purchased one, uh, and uh, you could buy it for like uh, one thousand or sixteen hundred. Also, uh, I've seen one, but uh, the uh, design of it is like why one is so expensive is because they can get more extraction, multiple extractions. So instead of like maybe. 50 extraction, it can give get up to like 200 extraction, uh, or they can produce like higher temperature of the water. So if the higher the temperature is going to dissolve that caffeine and the flavor of the of the coffee more, and then you get more rich and more like a flavored coffee. Um, that's that's another. Sometimes they just produce the steam. So if you have an espresso maker, it's not passing the the water through the, to, to the coffee grind is passing steam uh, through the coffee grind and it extracts more because steam can you can increase the temperature of steam to as many temperature you want as as uh, high as you want it but there cannot pass the boiling point of water 
So if it's liquid, it's going to be water, temperature of boiling point of water. But if you change it to a steam, then you can put very high, especially at high pressure, you can put very high temperature on the steam. So then the design of the coffee maker makes the difference in the price of the coffee maker. So that's how you use your multiple, uh, multiple extraction. Okay, going back to um, extraction, extraction for multiple extraction and the design of the coffee maker, that's what we talked. Uh, a second screenshot, I'm going to, I'm just going to set up one for extraction and ask you to do the second screenshot. The cap for the for the um, separate separated funnel also must be greased because it is not greased. When you turn it around and try to do shaking part, everything from the, if it's not completely sealed, then you would get the liquid leaking out into your hand. You don't want to do that. And I'm not going to put the cap on because I have grease and I don't want my chemicals to get grease on. So I can use a different one to show you how is. What do I mean? If this is not, this part is not sealed, then you are shaking. See how loose it is? It can come out. And it's come out empty is okay, but if you have the chemicals, as soon as it comes out, then you get all the chemicals in your hand. Also, when you vent it, you open the stopcock to vent the vapor or the gas. Um, if you forget to close it before you put it in the top upright position, the chemicals is going to spill everywhere. Uh, so you have to be careful with this part also. You vent it, you put it back. It's just like burette that you were using. You want to close the stuff up before you put any chemicals in. And this has to be greased, otherwise it won't be sealed. But has it been fortified? Okay, I guess uh, you are correct. And I'm going to uh, show you the setup for extraction. And I want you to do a a screenshot of the empty setup. This is a screenshot of this. Can you see the extraction setup? This is our second screenshot. And the screenshots are going to be uh, uploaded separately as a separate file. So you're your uh, lab report. I don't want to put the pictures in the lab report because if you put the pictures in the lab report, your lab report, the file would be huge and downloading and uh, everything else is going to be hard. The uh, downloading and grading is going to take longer uh, for me. I don't want to cause that trouble to myself. So pictures are going to be in separate, separate files. Uh, did you get the screenshot? Anybody? Needs the help? Do you want me to hold it again? Hi, okay. Professor, could you um, yes. show the setup again? I didn't get the screenshot. 
Sure. Uh, please do not use the, the recording for a screenshot because that does not indicate that you were present the lab time mentally, physically. Because the timing of the screenshot is going to be recorded. Not you. You don't have to time it. You don't have to show me the time and date. But when we analyze it, I can see that if the if the screenshot was taken as a picture during the lab time, or it was. Uh, it's a good suggestion though for the screenshot, but I strongly. Uh, suggest that you take the screenshot now, even though it is blurry, it's fine. You can take the screenshot. Uh, this just shows your participation during the lab. Is a checkpoint that all uh, online teaching should have some sort of a checkpoint. I'm sure you've taken other online classes for certificates, and they ask like multiple times. You have to take a quiz. You have to answer question. Do something silly that they know you're there. Uh, the first screenshot, you didn't take it? You want to take it now? I'm ready this to cool off, so I do have one minute. Here, take the first screenshot from the... That was the setup for... Reflux. longer what's the next step of the experiment Fifty milliliters of water into the separated funnel. So I'm going to add the water. Okay, uh, the problem, there is a problem here. The size of this is a 125, so I was expecting the 250, and if I can't find 250, uh, this is a 125 also. I'm going to have to have the volume here, so. Uh, I have the water in the separated funnel, and I will detach this and transfer to the separated funnel. Leave it here for now for being cleaned later. I already unplugged the electronics and I'm going to also turn off the water. Okay. Questions? The size of the separated fire is 125. The one that we are using now is 125. And I used uh, I used 30 milliliters of water. The quantity of the water is not going to make a huge difference because it's just the aqueous layer. Uh, we are going to bring 35 milliliters of the T-butyl uh, ether, T-butyl methyl ether. Shake it, rent it, and bring it back to separate. So I'm going to have to take 
this to the fume hood because I don't want to leave the ether to the working station. We are not here, but this actually smells nice for a change. Chemical that smells nice. I add the ether. So one of the ways that you can, you know, avoid contamination is like holding the cap using your hand that you're holding the bottle or transferring. It's okay. It's a good practice. cap it, make sure that it's secure, and mix it, open to release the pressure, then are you here or not, see the fizzing sound, it's very, it's not, there's no bicarbonate yet, so it's not that strong, Okay, so for three times, I uh, I was I sh shook it and I went it. Now I'm taking back to station. I leave it on the ring stand. Take the stopper out for the two layers to form. I have the two layers here. Is the two layer visible? Yes? Okay. Um, could you take one more screenshot of this? Okay. Now that we have the two layers separated, I can open the stop cook and drain the bottom layer. You can take a screenshot at any time as we. Are doing the extraction. So I want one, ex two images with extraction. One showing the layers and another one was just the setup before adding the chemicals. Okay, I, I'm not taking the last drop because I don't want to lose any of the top layer. And we go to the next extraction. Step five. Yes. Step six, we want to push the solution with water. And drain off the aqueous layer. Okay. So we add 25 milliliters of, of the um, of water to wash the solution. Washing is basically removing anything that any impurity that is water soluble. And we drain the Aqueous layer. See what happens if I don't take the cap off and I try to drain it? 
See, even though stuff cook is open, nothing comes out because it's uh, because it creates vacuum there. So in order for it to get the and it's it's kind of choking and it's trying to get the air from the bottom and it is going to destroy the uh, the equilibrium or the two layers. So that's why for better practice or for the right technique, you take the stopper, the, the cap or the stopper out first before you open the, the stopper. You take the glass stopper out first. What's the next solution that I'm supposed to add? Next one, sodium bicarbonate, and how much? 25. Sodium bicarbonate, 25. OK. Let's move to the fumer. And here, 25 milliliters of Sodium bicarbonate, the saturated sodium bicarbonate. And what's the purpose of adding sodium bicarbonate again? Gets rid of the excess benzoic acid that's unreacted. Excess of the benzoic acid. Because it's an acid-based reaction that it will produce um, carbonic acid, which decomposes, it can create more of the carbon dioxide. It depends on how much leftover of sodium I'm sorry, benzoic acid we have. If we don't have much benzoic acid, it's not going to be, the reaction is not going to be very significant. And you don't see a lot of gas being produced. I guess that those extra minutes that we had with the reflux, it did help for complete reaction, or it did help more with the complete reaction. Okay. We're going to drain. The aqueous layer, make sure the cap is off. And next, sodium chloride solution. Wash with sodium chloride solution, yes? Okay. The sodium chloride solution should get rid of um, water within the within the organic layer. Perfect. With the ether layer, there might be still some moisture, water that is left, uh, saturated sodium chloride. It acts as a liquid anhydrous agent. It can minimize the water into the in the organic layer and it makes you see that if you notice now the layer organic layer the top layer is more clear 
that means there is no water left. Change the beaker. That was almost full. And Next, next step. Transfer the organic layer into a beaker, right? Or LMI class. Transfer to LMI class. Ether layer. We transfer from the top layer because we know that the bottom layer here we have more moisture. We try to avoid transferring the the uh, aqueous layer into. Then we add calcium chloride. How much of calcium chloride should I add? There should be no quantity there. If it gives you, it just tries to make you students not think. But if you have, and I usually have to do it for organic one, and I normally don't do that for organic two. The more moisture and water you have in the organic layer, more of calcium chloride is needed. It's very important to close the calcium chloride container right after use otherwise it would absorb the um, moisture from the air and it gets like a piece of rock and it's not efficient anymore it would be hard to to use it so when you look at this now the little crystals or balls of the calcium chloride they are if they are moving around that means they are not they have not absorbed water and they are not saturated if they absorb water, they become like a paste and they stick to the bottom of the flask. They don't move around. That means they are already saturated with water. In that case, you would need extra calcium chloride to add. I have few that they are moving around, but the bottom of the flask still is like, you know, you have pasty and um, you can actually just to be safe, I'm just going to add about tip of a spatula or half a spatula more to make sure all the water has been removed. Because if the water is not removed here, it won't be removed with the hot plate either. And then it will show up as an OH in the in IR. That was the anhydrous calcium chloride that would absorb the um, absorb the moisture. They are moving around now, and since they are moving around, that means we have enough of the calcium chloride. I don't have to add any more. So I'm going to bring a beaker and get the mass of empty beaker. I want you to record the mass of empty, dry, clean beaker. Make sure there is no moisture. I get the mass. Sure, it's there. And we have the mass of them. Can I record that number, please? You can take a screenshot. Or record the number. See, it's moving a lot. It's the number is changing because I'm talking and the balance is very scale is very sensitive. Whatever number that you you catch, that's fine. 
because the difference in the decimal, so it goes 69.26 to 69.27. It's jumping up and down. So whatever number you have there is going to be good enough. Uh, the number that without description it shows. So for your record, I'm going to give you the number that is actually stays there more often is 260. 261 was the one, the number that it showed um, more often. Because it's very sensitive. When the AC is on, I'm going to show you that if I fan my hand around this, this number is going to change even more, like this. It's not the mass that is changing, it's the pressure over the balance that is changing. So you have that number. Now, we are going to transfer the liquid portion into the into the beaker. I'm going to set up the hot plate first and then transfer just to make sure that uh, there is more of or most of the moisture is absorbed. You should give about two to five minutes time for the, for the anhydrous agent to work. So I'm going to set up in the beaker. Transfer the liquid portion only. Basically, you're decanting, meaning that you transfer the liquid without any, getting any of the solid. And if it, that if that happens, it's just a bad lab technique. So you have to repeat yourself. I was trying to get the last drop of it. And these pieces of calcium chloride it went in. I don't need them there. I only needed to get the, the moisture out. So now I have to be more careful. And it was good that it was showing at least we have some calcium chloride that did not react. So that means the moisture or the water was was absorbed completely. We place a wood stick. What wood stick does, it helps the boiling. It's going to make the boiling faster. Is there any step or any questions that I should follow or I miss? Does it ask you to wash this with the extra Eater or no? Yes? Okay. If that is the case, then we are going to wash that with three to five milliliters. This is just trying to transfer every drop of the product into the beaker. So it does help percent recovery. So we wash the flask. We are going to let's see where is the light to heat it up until it stops boiling. Heater is going to boil at much lower temperature compared to ester. So when the ether is done boiling, then it will be. Um, it's going to be a lot easier or higher. It would require much higher temperature for the ester to, uh, to boil. So ether would boil first. You, you won't see any bubbles forming. When all the ether is gone, it takes a long time before the ester starts boiling. And 
for us to be smart, we have to just take the flat, the beaker off the, plate, uh, the hot plate at that point because we do not want to decompose or evaporate the, the um, ester. We want to keep the ester, we want to evaporate the ether. This is going to the solid base, so I'm going to dispose into the solid base. And while that is boiling, for organic structure, you would hear already for your organic one, so you know where everything is. Um, but we do have bottles for disposal, solid, aqueous, halogenated, and non halogenated. The uh, general rule for using gloves in the lab is that when your gloves changes color, it's time to change your gloves. So when you see yellow color uh, on your gloves, that means that you have touched acid or base or something that it should not be there on your hands, on your skin. And the chance that, well, these days we're not supposed to touch our faces anyway. The chance of that being transferred to your face is high. So I didn't dispose this because I wanted to show you. Even like this color change of yellow color, that's time for changing your, your gloves. It's not like doctor's office that as soon as you, you know, leave one patient, you have to change gloves here. You can keep your gloves on until it changes color. Okay, we have one concern. You want, don't want to dry the sample to decomposition, so we have to watch this constantly. This is a good time to answer your questions while we are monitoring this. And also, like if you were the one working in the lab, just cleaning up your workstation to get rid of everything that's not necessary anymore in the in the lab. So this is boiling aggressively. I can probably bring it closer for you to see it. With the stuff boiling initially, uh, that means all the ether is gone. So we use an hydrous agent to dry the solvent. Drying solvent is just removing water from the solvent. And now we are heating up to evaporate the solvent because we have a solution. Our solution is made of ether as solvent and our uh, ester as the solute. We don't need the solvent. We only need the solute. So we have to heat it up in order to, to get the pure sample. Um, do you have questions for me? The plate, I have it at uh, low heat, like so between like three and four, uh, it should be good. But I'm more concerned about the, the stopping the 
or finishing up the vapor or boiling of the first compound. And right there, I have to stop. The detail in the lab report, uh, three or four is fine. Yes, you can put the, between three and four. That would be the setting on the, on the hot plate. And you monitor the boiling. And you wait until it stops boiling. And if you have the boiling point for your eater, you can also use a thermometer. If the solution <laughs> shows boiling point, let's say boiling point for the uh, for the eater is 50. Okay. Now, if the if the solution is boiling, the temperature is not going to pass like much higher than 50. But if the temperature of the mixture reaches like 60 degree at that temperature, you are 100% sure that there is no more of the of the eater left. So you can stop the boiling. But for me, not bringing thermometer or not using thermometer and also for safety, because then the thermometer could be heavy. I don't want to leave it there. I don't want to take some of it with the thermometer to keep the percent recovery high also. I monitor until it stops boiling, and when it does stop boiling, I know the ether is is gone. Oh, and excuse me. You get a lot of product. You would get about like ten drops of the product. The color is another indication. When you see like a light tan color, you stop your uh, stop heating also. So if it turns like yellow color, dark yellow, brown color, that means you burned out. You burned the product. Let me get your question. Sorry. Yes, your question. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. I, my computer's just lagging. But my question was, what color is the substance in the flask over there? I cannot see. It's like a, it's like water right now. No color. That's probably why you can't see it. So in the beaker, it's just clear. But okay, as you. As the eater is evaporating, the product is like a light yellow color or tan color. So when you your product gets like a tan color, that's another indication that you have the the eater is gone. And then the volume also. Okay, it's stop boiling. It is stopped boiling. I we use 10 grams of benzoic acid, so it's going to be more than drop, more than the 10 drops that I said. So it stopped boiling. I can stop the heat at this point. And since in the procedure and you're not here, I'm going to also bring a thermometer and check the temperature. If the temperature goes higher than 50, I can stop. I have enough liquid here. I can do the okay. Temperature is way past 60. Definitely, there is no heater there, and I stop the the heat at this point. My next step would be to measure the mass and get the percent yield. was higher than 60. It was just moving up. 65 is fine. That's what you have. Let me see what's now. The temperature of the solution was 70. I, I just said it was higher than 60. So 70, you can record that temperature and say that at 70 degrees, you stop. 
70 degree, you make sure at that to point there is no more heat left. We are going to leave it to cool down slightly because you don't want to measure the temperature, measure the mass for hot object. We let it cool down and we measure the mass. With the mass of the product, you can calculate the percent recovery. You have the mass of the beaker already. And this is going to give you the mass of the beaker plus the product. It's still too hot. Professor, when will we do the hot water bath? I didn't notice if we did that yet. We didn't. We, we had the choice of using hot water bath or hot plate, low temperature. I used the hot plate and I put it directly on the hot plate. So we didn't use the hot water bath. Okay, thank you. So there are two choices you could use. Because it's eater, uh, you should never use direct flame. So you should not use like a open flame because this eater is flammable. And for gentle heating, you can set up your hot plate at the very low temperatures, like I did between three and four, or you can use the you can use hot water bath, either one. Okay, measuring the mass of the product plus the sample, sample plus the beaker is 78.240. Oops, moving. Okay, seventy-eight two four zero. You can record that for the uh, for the mass. Yes, sample plus the beaker. Okay. Any questions? What's your next step? You don't have to write the you don't have to write the reports until Thursday, right? For Thursday, the first thing I'm going to save the sample and I am going to um, do the IR first thing um, for the lab on Thursday, we would do first IR and then we do the rest of the other experiment. Going to save the sample, going to label it and save it. We have a cabinet that when we are saving our sample, we leave it in the cabinet for Thursday. And I'm just going to my name because I was the one here. Okay, questions? Let me see if you have a concern for me so I can answer your questions. You can complete the report and just add the IR later, or I just want to give like some time to make sure that there is really no more eater there. Same time as the, yes, at 12.30. Okay. I I might do the IR when I'm coming back for my organic one lab and I email you the IR and we do a practice IR next class to see it. So you will get the information. Okay? I will email on D2L definitely. Yes. On D2L. 
and then uh, that way you have the report so you can include that into the into your lab report and you will see me doing dir next class that way um, you would get the the information i mean how to do ir how to perform the ir experiment uh, did you take the screenshot of the mass of the beaker no we took a, a screenshot of the mass of the empty one but when you had product in it the mass wasn't visible okay so it's the empty one that would be one screenshot right that would be one screenshot you can use that as one screenshot and then you had two for extraction one without the liquid just the setup one with the two layers of the liquid and then uh, one for the reflux system so that adds up to four so if you have any three of those that's sufficient uh, we are let me finish let me stop the recording we are, we are still here we are not done so i can answer other questions but since we are going to stop the experiment i'm going to stop the recording at this point